So welcome, everybody. My name is Mike Tresca. I am the committee chair, CarPGA. Uh, we are doing our uh, monthly virtual session as we uh, plan to do. We did take a break in um, the summer months, uh, partially because we, were, we wanted to make sure we had a good lineup, uh, which I'm very excited to say we do. And uh, partially because we wanted to make sure we were able to get uh, attendance and, and visitors and eyeballs. So uh, before we get to our guest, which I'm very excited uh, to introduce, um, I did want to uh, do a couple of uh, housekeeping uh, tips that we just wanted to cover. One of them was to welcome Lucio Pimentel, if I'm saying your name right, Lucio. Um, he's our newest member. Hello, he's waving. Hi, Lucio. Uh, welcome. <laughs> Uh, Lucio uh, just joined, so he, he's part of uh, our group here, uh, which continues to grow. And that's one of our goals, as um, you all may recall from our annual report. Um, the, one of our other goals is was to do these, um, and we are archiving them on the YouTube channel. So this is probably my monthly plug. I may never stop at saying this until we get to a certain number, uh, asking any members to uh, subscribe, because that's where these videos will reside and also where um, a lot of our video content, when we have commercials, uh, RPG Research does commercials and such, we'll make sure they're uh, prominently displayed there. And then finally, uh, we have our annual report coming up. Um, that's homework for me and for uh, the board. So we will uh, review where we're at and where we're going for 2022. Uh, that won't come out next month. Uh, that'll be uh, hopefully in January. We'll see if I can turn it around depending on how the rest of my life is running. and. Um, we look, look forward to that. And one of our goals was to extend our reach and engage with uh, more RPG scholars, more folks in the field. Um, and uh, I was challenged by the board to say, okay, let's try everybody we know. Let's see who we know, who is a, at foremost advocates in the field. Um, and of course I know John, so I'm very excited to welcome John Peterson. Welcome John uh, to the CarPGA, both as a member and as a speaker. Um, we are very excited to have you here. Let's see if I can not make this about me on the spotlight here. There we go. Now it's about you. You're welcome. <laughs> oh, I know. Great. What, I have the focus now? This yes. is like my head is the big, booming, <laughs> 1984 right. apple right. hat head. Yes, yep, yes. you got it. You're welcome. Um, so uh, I uh, welcome. I'm so excited for you to be here. Uh, and as you and I were catching up, which I feel like we haven't talked, we haven't actually haven't talked in forever, other than I think talking through reviewing where I review your book and then you probably see it later, but we haven't. Um, I want to do, normally we do our uh, sessions the third week of uh, the month, but we moved this up because I wanted to keep it relevant and make sure we were referencing Game Wizards, which um, I was very excited to see and uh, was really, really just um, excited to review, frankly. Um, so I, I was super excited about that. So we'll get to Game Wizards. Here's Game Wizards. Here it is, for those of you who are not aware. Um, but I, uh, I did, <laughs> like, yeah, that's, that's my book. I, uh, I did want to sort of start with um, you, because I think for those folks who don't know you, I know yeah, there's no one else behind you, so it's got to be you. <laughs> um, uh, you know, RPG scholarship, certainly, we, you and I have talked about this, uh, has come up, and it came up, I think, sort of started and then shot up pretty quickly. And I think I... I I'm not embarrassed to say I believe you're the leader of it uh, in terms of the current RPG scholarship. But uh, how did you how did you land there? Like, what was your how did you end up deciding to do this? Was it something that sort of came to you naturally? Something that you decided to do? Sort of worked your way up? Yeah. Well. Well. First of all, uh, thanks so much for having me. And again, yes. for what you're doing with the CarPGA, it seems like a cool group. It's my pleasure to be here. And I mean. Uh, how do you start on this? Well, obviously you start because you're super into these games, right? And for me, I mean, I was a bit of a late bloomer. It's not that I was unaware of D&D when I was a kid, kid, but it wasn't until I, after college in the 90s when Magic the Gathering came out, actually, that I started getting super into tabletop gaming. It was really through playing Magic that I ended up meeting a group of people who were doing a heavily hacked um, second ed D&D campaign that I fell in with. And this, this was all in Boston, but a number of us then transplanted to Berkeley, California, where I, I was running games then by then third edition. You know, it's in the context of doing third edition games that, you know, I, I guess I did the most um, DMing that I'd ever done. Um, you know, I, I had a number of campaigns that I did around then. And then and then this game called World of Warcraft came out and I got obsessed with that, which I guess happened to a lot of people and spent maybe the first like 18 months of classic WoW. Um, I was a pretty hardcore raider, but it was around that time that um, 
you could call it an intervention perhaps. So I went with some friends of mine to England and was taken away from WOW for a couple of days. And when I was in the British Museum one day, um, I saw, and you see these all over the web now at the time, I'd never seen them before, um, in a display case, a, a die, a 20-sided die from the first century AD that was a Roman manufacturer. And I had this kind of moment then where I asked myself really how far back everything went, everything that I'd been playing with. Okay, if 20-sided dice existed in like the first century AD, like where, what are the lines? Somebody must have figured this out, I thought. And the, the, the first question I really got my head wrapped around was, okay, like who first rolled a die? Maybe a D20, maybe just a regular die. Again, some kind of like table of potential results, a, a model that was, you know, on paper to decide whether or not some fictional event happened, like whether or not I hit you with my sword or something. And so I decided to start reading about that. And I read quite a bit um, just of books about the history of probability and things like that, and about the history of gaming. I read every book I could find about the history of war gaming that became clear pretty quickly. That's where the complex simulation systems that I've been familiar with from D&D and everything else had their roots in that. But it was that quest that got me started. Maybe by like 2007, you know, I was pretty sure I was going to write a book about this. And that book became Planet of the World, which came out, you might note, in 2012. So it was about five years between when I had a pretty good idea I was going to write something about this until, you know, a 425,000 word book, um, which is what Playing It The World is. If you're yeah. thinking about buying it, like that's, that's what you're in for if you happen <laughs> across a copy. Um, that really just kind of explores the roots of where, where does the DM, the referee, come from? Where do hit points come from? What, what, are, what are experience points and levels? And what are the fantasy influences in this? Like, why are wizards casting fireballs? And like, all, all, just basically any question I thought might, I could find an answer to that might be interesting, I basically just like shoved into playing the world. Um, but, and then of course, when, you know, you, when it got to a certain point, I was like, okay, like this just has to come out. I could work on this forever, right? I could spend like 20 years just continuing to work on this. But I think there was a lot of use in putting out a book about this initially, because then people learned that I existed, learned the kind of things that I was doing. And then suddenly a lot of people started coming to me with stuff with, I was there and I, I did this, or you should really meet this person, or Peter Adkison encountered it somehow and asked to meet with me at Gen Con and, you know, got we got to talking and, you know, I went with him to Seattle and he just sat me down at a table with Richard Garfield, sat me down at a table with Jonathan Tweet, with Lonnie Cook, with, you know, take your pick, you know, just introducing me to all these people. Wow. And, you know, I just started picking up more and more of this and, you know, the next thing you know, I'm getting asked to do pieces for academic conferences, for academic anthologies. And then, you know, it was pretty clear that like this was a thing and I was going to kind of keep doing it. And I guess Game Wizards is the latest manifestation of me just kind of keeping doing that stuff that started then. Yeah, and, and certainly uh, you can see the evolution, right? I mean, um, uh, starting with playing at the world, to your point, I mean, playing at the world to me was sort of the final authority on all those questions. And it's such a great base, but it's a lot, right? It is a lot because it's sort of like you can go back pretty far or pretty wide in terms of what role playing is. But that is really, in my opinion, um, if not the final word, certainly a really big word on what gaming, defining the role-playing space to allow books like Game Wizards, which are, you know, by necessity, sort of briefer and a little bit more focused, which I think is great too. So they really do complement each other really well. Um, how did you get to Game Wizards then? So, you know, that's, a, that's quite a big jump. I mean, this is a different style of book. Uh, I would say, based on the stuff that I've read, it's it's a little different. Um, but how'd you get here from from sort of playing at the world? Well, so I mean, after Playing at the World came out, you know, one of the things actually, and this is I think where we last met at Gen Con. Yep. Uh, one of the things that I got wrapped up in was a D and D documentary project <laughs> yep. going around, and it was the people who did the D and D documentary project who actually had discovered that some court records related to Gary Gygax's ouster were being housed at the Elkhorn County Courthouse in Wisconsin, not far from Lake Geneva, which is, you know, where I guess was the scene of a lot of this legal drama playing out. And they had gone and gotten some of them. And so I, I decided, I would guess it was at a Gary Con or something, uh, which takes place in Lake Geneva. I was like, okay, it's a short drive to Elkhorn. I'll go there and kind of ask them to show me what they have for those court cases. And um, they had quite a bit 
And actually, if I recall, they charged you, they wouldn't let you like take pictures or scan them yourself. You had to pay them to photocopy them for you at a buck and a quarter a page. Oh, man. That's and so you kind of have to make some <laughs> tough decisions. Um, but I, I made a couple different visits to that courthouse over the next couple of years and just got them to copy more and more of this material for me. And that ultimately led me to write a piece, an essay I wrote in 2014, that was called The Ambush at Sheridan Springs. Mm -hmm. And this, this is a, just something I put up on Medium like for free, um, but it was, you know, a look at mechanically how it was that Gary Gygax lost control of TSR. Who owned which shares, kind of who, who, you know, what were the big issues, I guess, that were confronting the company at the time? You know, who were these Bloom brothers and like what stake did they have and why did they have that stake? Um, who was this Lorraine Williams person that came along and what was up with her? And so, I, you know, and it's not a particularly long piece. It's still up. You can still read it in its original form. And, you know, I'm sure somebody someday will go through and figure out all the ways Game Wizards is different from that piece. But, but ultimately, like when I released this medium piece, a lot of people liked it. Like it was weird, um, you know, like when I write a random blog piece, you know, it's not the kind of thing where I usually get like 100,000 hits in a day. Mm -hmm. And that was the situation with the ambush at Sheridan Springs, like Mark Andreessen, the venture capitalist retweeted it, like a whole bunch wow. of just interest from more mainstream people was evident. So I kind of kept that in the back of my head and was like, okay, like I should just keep like gathering data about this. And so... Whenever I talk to TSR employees, I'd be like, hey, do you have any memos or anything left over? Something came up on eBay that was related to this. Um, you know, I'd buy it if I could, or at least uh, take a, you know, copy the JPEG of the, yeah. you know, the item if I don't get to buy it, you know, so I at least have some fragment of it. But I mean, you do that for a few years, actually, and you start being able to fill in a lot mm -hmm. of the story. Um, so it was a really gradual accretion like within the original Ambush at Sheridan Springs article that turned into Game Wizards. And I actually keep the Ambush at Sheridan Springs as the title of the last chapter. And indeed the, the little scene at the beginning that depicts the events on the day of the ambush in October of 1985 um, that starts off Game Wizards also starts off this, uh, this medium piece, uh, the Ambush at Sheridan Springs. So, I mean, for me, it was just, it's a book length version of that essay. Now, what it really fills in that was not in the original essay at all is all the Gygax and Arneson stuff. I mean, really all that the original Ambush essay says is because Arneson was no longer a shareholder at the end, he's not relevant to that story, was that, you know, he was sidelined in the 70s and he didn't only share. So he's kind of irrelevant to this piece. Here we look at that in scathing detail <laughs> um, because really this the story of Game Wizards is the story of an epic battle for D&D that many parties were involved with. It was like a war of the five armies, right? Where like it may have started with like a couple of people fighting and then like everybody else just interjected. And by the end, it's it's a, you know, Hobbesian war of all against all pretty much. And it is fascinating to see um, not everybody's a villain and not everybody's a hero. There's definitely blame and credit to go around. I think I think one of the things you you said succinctly is, um, if you're looking to sort of settle who did D&D kind of thing and can you just name a winner, uh, you know, that's not the answer, right? The, the point of this is to show these are flawed humans doing what they thought was right, all of them, be it Dave or Gary or anybody in between. And um, they, they definitely made mistakes and they also did some great things and, and it's all there in their own voice, which I think, you know, my favorite example, uh, which I don't know if, I, if people understand this, is I, I compare it to Devil in the White City. Um, which is a story about both the serial killer who was operating at the time and, of course, the World's Fair. And it's all primary sources. So it's not a lot of interpretation. It's not somebody fictionalizing conversations. There may be some interpretation based on what people said, but it's really primary sources. And it's amazing how that cuts through the noise. I, for me, maybe there's people who will never cut through the noise. Uh, when you use primary sources to tell a story, um, that frankly tells itself. You're just, you're almost, you know, just or gathering it together in a way that we can consume it better. Um, but did, did, was that something from a chronological perspective you decided to come at it? Or how did you decide sort of what the, the, the through line was for this, for Game Wizards? Yeah, it certainly was chronological in the sense, I mean, you know, you, you could look at this like books I read around the same time were like Bad Blood, you know, the Theranos <laughs> story of uh, yeah. the yeah. poems and all that. I mean, cer certainly I knew that this was a corporate tragedy from the start because I knew how it ended, right? I'd already right. written the piece about how it ended. 
And I knew that there was going to be a lot about mismanagement and things like that. And you kind of, you, you, you know, I really wanted to be able to capture this in a way, though, that we have the same uncertainty about events that the people involved do in each stage of the book. They, mm-hmm. they have no idea in 1974 that, you know, D&D is going to amount to anything more than a $300 idea. Right. Right. <laughs> You say, yeah, yeah, I show the original contract for D&D that, it, you know, the m- maximum amount they imagined it could ever be worth to buy it back for was $300. And I, I want to keep, you know, us and them in that just complete ignorance of what's about to happen as much as possible. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, that, that lends itself, if you want to do that, to a very chronological story where, again, things look amazing and everyone's trying to figure out why they're amazing. Probably it's because I'm amazing. And like I did this and, like, <laughs> and then, you know, um, eventually you get to a point where um, some of your assumptions aren't quite uh, unfolding as you, you, you thought they might and uh, things start to go south and things then very rapidly go south. And the next thing you know, if you're Gary Gygax, uh, you're out of the company. Right. Yeah. And, and certainly that, that's a, to your point about Sheridan Springs, that that's a compelling place to start and end. Right. Um, but you can see how much more opportunity there is uh, because you see, Like you're like, wow. And then he lost control and then Lorraine comes in and then you're like, well, okay. I don't know that we get to blame Lorraine for everything as, as certainly that was the narrative I heard later. Um, There's, there's blame to go around, but uh, you know, obviously there were other challenges and then, uh, and then the book stops and you're like, (laughs) please tell me more. We need to keep going. (laughs) <laughs> Look, man, it's not all on me. Look, you write books about this. This is this guy, Ben Riggs, right? He's doing this book that's called Slaying the Dragon, who I've been working with actually fairly closely, I'd say, um, over the past you know, year and a half or so, um, just to make sure that we're like in sync on right. these things. And like, you know, he's going to tell the whole story of the Williams era, like all the things that happened then. Um, okay. It's not all on me. I, okay. There's plenty okay. more voices uh, should be talking about this. And I mean, I think... You know, Ben, Ben, you know, is more focused, I think, on like interviews and with the principals. I think it's, it may be in, in some ways harder to get primaries, you know, for his era than it is for mine um, yeah. in the sense that, you know, um, d- just in terms of who, who, who is willing to share what, I think yes. it may be a little easier for me. Yes. Um, but, you know, so I, don't worry, there's more information about this coming um, and I'm sure it'll be awesome. Yes, that's fantastic. And, and to your point, you, you, it's not just you. I'm sure there are other people, but uh, you know, I don't read all their books. I read all your books, so we'll see. Hopefully, I'll look forward to that. That's exciting. Uh, I knew Ben was working on something. I actually wasn't sure uh, what, what era he was going to cover. Uh, what's been the reception like to the book? I mean, it seems fine. I mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't look at sales figures. I, I honestly don't look much at reviews. Um, I mean, I, I'm I'm aware of things that like like your review on Ian Roth. Thank you very much. Um, My pleasure. You know, I'm I'm aware of things that are published on blogs or sources that I read. Mm-hmm. And you know, I I honestly, and this is a change in me too. Like when I did playing the world, I was really interested, in like what people saw. And if there's like an Amazon <laughs> review, I want to like, you know, I want to talk to that person and like <laughs> explain to them what it is I'm trying to do. And I'm not there anymore. I'll put it this way: a couple things made me not there. You know, when we did, as you know, I, I work some with um, um, Penguin Random House and Wizards on um, more pop culture projects like Art and Arcana yep. and the Heroes mm-hmm. Feast book. You know, we did Heroes Feast. Literally, the first re- review we got was a one star review on Amazon. It was from somebody who found a page that had too much white space on it and oh. took a picture of it and was like, there, there are no pictures in this book. Like, this is a total ripoff. <laughs> Because there's like, there's no picture. And like that review is like the most prominent review. Yes. Uh, you know, and Art and Arcana, like almost all the early reviews were about, I ordered this from Amazon and it was scuffed when it showed up one star. Right. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. You know, after yeah. that, I just stopped reading this stuff. It just, yeah. it's not helpful. <laughs> yeah, I know, you know, what the other thing that's uh, terrifying, which is happening right now, is uh, someone doing an entire thread about a book that you did. So where they just, they go page by page. That is an experience that's happening for me. And I was like, I, can't, I had to stop reading it. I was like, I can't, I can't, I can't look at it anymore because they're going page by page to the book. And you know, you're just waiting for the things that you're like, oh, I must have, I know I didn't do something right. And then, you know, they either they find it or they skip over it. And it's a huge relief, but it's too, it's too tense. I can't do it anymore. So I'm right there with you. Um, what's been there? It's been real quiet from what I've seen, because we had a lot of <laughs> Uh, drama on new TSR and a lot of other stuff. It's been very quiet 
Um, you know, some of the principles I've heard, you know, the ones who are alive, obviously, but really not a lot. I mean, have you seen reception? It's obviously some of the folks contributed to it because I know you thanked them or at least were involved. But have you gotten any one way or the other, anybody saying anything or has it been relatively quiet? Um, I mean, I, I talk to people privately. I've certainly talked to people in the Gagax family about right. it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they, they, they seem they seem OK with it. OK, yeah. well, it's, I'm sure the primary sources helps a little bit versus. I think a lot of people are learning things from it. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, look, you know, you know um, this is a very different kind of book and a different kind of market than, say, Art and Arcana, right? Art and Arcana right. is a mass market. But, you know, this is a book I, I write with MIT Press now. All of my scholarly stuff, as you can see, is coming out under fair imprint. This is stuff that goes through peer review and, like, is really kind of more um, oriented towards a scholarly audience. And, you know, I, I, I don't really promote it, I guess, much in the sense of right. I'm not, you know, I'm not really out kind of beating the bushes, trying to convince people to follow it or, you know, fo follow me on this social media <laughs> or whatever. I'm also a little past that, I think. Um, you know, I, I look at this like I write for posterity at this point, right? right. For in my scholarly stuff. I mean, this is stuff that I hope other scholars will be able to build on. And I mean, in that sense, I think it's done very well. I mean, it's getting precisely the kind of engagement that I imagined it would. And, you know, I mean, you know, I don't know if you saw just today, a few hours ago, uh, Jacobin reviewed it. You know, Jacobin, this is a ultra left wing magazine and website that like, you know, it is big, big with socialists that you know, viewed it as a searing indictment of, you know, capitalism and its effects on art. And like, I could certainly see people looking at Game Wizards through that lens, right? Right. Um, so, I mean, yeah, and I mean, I, I got to write things for Polygon and Wired. And I mean, so it got like, you know, the kinds of, it got the kind of splash that, you know, I, I thought it would get. But I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't really know. I, I have no insight into its sales figures whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, no, I wasn't asking about sales figures. I was more interested in certainly, um, did it settle any arguments? And I, you it's know, maybe you never settle, will. <laughs> maybe you never will. <laughs> the kinds of arguments that you're talking about. So I mean, yeah. that, you know, I mean, look, we can't convince people on the internet to get vaccinated. We can't convince people <laughs> on the internet that the earth is, you know, round. <laughs> And there are people willing, willing to like build their own rocket and shoot themselves into the sky out of their belief that the earth is actually flat. Yeah. Um, there are people you're not going to be able to convince of anything at this point. And people yeah. are so entrenched on it. And this is stuff I don't see. Like I don't really use social media that, that much. I, I maintain a Twitter account and a Facebook page, you know, to be polite. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I don't really spend a lot of my time scouring through how people are arguing about this stuff. I am certainly aware they were arguing. I get tagged in these arguments and I see the extremist positions come out in these things. And mm -hmm. I just don't engage with it myself. I'm just not interested. <laughs> I think that's smart. I think one of the things it's funny you, you mentioned this and um, I certainly used to say it, too. And it was fascinating to me because you see you pointed to the was it Who Am I article in Space Gamer that Guy Gax wrote. And then there's the Inc. article, which I, w I went back through. And man, what an interesting snapshot of sort of the hubris in some ways that um, gaming was like, which I, I've said this. I've been like, oh, there's, and it's, I, I think there are, I'll still defend that, that there are parallels between gaming and business and that there's things that you learn in gaming that carry over. I wouldn't say that that means I can run a company, um, but it was fascinating because uh, it was sort of out for everybody to see. G I mean, Gygax didn't hide it. Certainly, Inc. talked about it and were like, what a peculiar but fun, you know, wow, these kooky guys are running a company and there's three of them. And I guess they all they seem to figure it out. And, you know, you were like, <laughs> narrate a voice. They didn't, you know, kind of thing, which I thought was, <laughs> was great. But it was fascinating to me to sort of show I think some of that was about class too, right? Where it was sort of like, yeah, these guys who may not have been business educated, and you mentioned they sent them to business class later, right? They sort of went on some kind of training, um, wanted to prove they could do it uh, and run a company. And I thought that was a fascinating perspective of where you think of D and D is so entrenched in education, educational elites, so to speak. Um, but here were Gary and and Co saying, you know, and they were had different levels of education, basically saying, we think we can run a company, even though we don't know the business, whatever was the, considered the business wisdom at the time. And I thought that was a fascinating um, 
piece that came out for me just reading, you know, and look, maybe that I'm sure there were things they did hopefully right, but there were also things that they didn't do because they were, they didn't know how to run a business. They were figuring out as they went. Well, they, I mean, I think they thought they could run a business because they had up to a point run a business to become very successful. Right. Now, you know, whether, you know, I think as, as a hobbyist, um, Gary knew exactly the levers to pull, exactly the things to do to make, you know, a war game successful in the war game hobby. And he had for some time, and, you know, he kind of pushed D&D &D in that way through Gen Con, through zines, to get it to up one level, right? To level one as a, as a product in a company. And like, you know, it turned out it was really good. And a lot of people engaged with it. And a lot of people could see in those rules dimly, there's something really cool you can do with this. And I think a lot of those people brought it to like level two mm -hmm. and, you know, Gary's tireless promotion, you know, he made a lot of good decisions early on about printers and print runs. And, you know, he knew the hobby level distribution business quite well. As soon as the big accident happened, as soon as James Dalzak wrote the third had putatively disappeared in the steam tunnels and in fact had not, but resulting publicity suddenly turned this into a juggernaut. And as soon as revenue quadrupled, as soon as now Random House is their distributor, things suddenly were very different. Now this was not a hobby business anymore. Now he was not figuring out, am I going to be doing better than like Mark Miller over at GDW? I see you, Mark. Right. Like you're going down, <laughs> you know, which is like kind of, you know, are you Greg Stafford over there at the right. Kiosium? Um, you know, once it got beyond that and suddenly now I'm striking deals with Mattel, I could care less what Games Workshop is doing. You know, I'm eyeing Milton Bradley and Parker Brothers and like, we're going to take this from this $20 million business that it is now and become a $250 million business in the next, you know, five years or something. Um, that's when they were out of their debt completely. And there was no amount of like, you know, remedial management training <laughs> that was going to, you know, give Gygax the passion to run a business where, you know, you are going to deal with middle management. You are going to deal with people that disagree with you, that you're going to have to delegate responsibility to. And you can't just delegate responsibility and then tell people, well, you didn't do what I would have done. And you guys are idiots. And like, you know, which is largely how he viewed running a medium-sized business. And right. There, there was no fix for that, right? And he hated it. He didn't want to do it. I mean, this is what that Who Am I piece, you know, really shows is his inner conflict and this, this sense of almost obligation that he felt. He's like, because I got us this far, like it would be, you know, shirking my responsibility if I refused to continue to offer my benevolent stewardship to this venture. <laughs> um, and like, but because he really didn't have an appetite for it, you know, I mean, he, he kind of blew it off. And then yeah. like the Blooms kind of did what they could, but they didn't have sufficient authority to really be able to act without him constantly second guessing them. Right. It was just a mess. And yeah, yeah I mean, there was, there was no way for that to work, you know, at anything other than the hobby level. At the hobby level, you know, he was a master at that. He understood that so well. Um, the actual like running a business and how we pay taxes, <laughs> you know, things like yeah. that, that, that's when they were in trouble. And it's really interesting. I, I, I made this comment too about, it, it's almost inspiring in a lot of ways because this is not new. I mean, this is this is startup challenges. This is every hobby gamer who's got their PDFs out on drive through RPG trying to make a buck. Um, this is everybody sort of saying, I wonder how I how well I can do with my passion that I enjoy. And suddenly does it, you know, does it can I feed my family while doing it? I mean, it was also fascinating to me that, you know, a few times Gary stepped away. Um, because of life and said either health or family. He was like, I can't, I can't keep doing this right now. And then he'd come, he'd inevitably come back because that was his passion. But, um, you know, there's definitely a lot of parallels for, I think, uh, gaming entrepreneurs, let's call them that, who have probably more options than they did to do this. But his story, I don't, th not, not just Gary's story, but the story of TSR, I don't think is necessarily, I mean, there's nepotism. There's all this stuff that happens that I think happens when small companies grow um, and suddenly it's not a family business anymore. It's a, like you said, it's, it's this much larger entity and the growing pains, you either figure them out or they, they sort of eat the company up. Um, and it, it, to me, it's, that, that's what this story, one of the many things that came out of this is how clear that is and how not unique it is in some ways. Um, it's just that we think it's unique because it's for gaming and it was very much the TSR story, but there's plenty of you know, uh, startup challenges that didn't go right 
with other companies who had the same problems um, that I've seen, certainly in the past. So I thought that was really interesting that you told that story. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, one, one way I always like to put it is, you know, look at it like there are um, 25 employees of TSR prior to the Egbert incident, right? <laughs> and like, you know, they just ramp up to the point there's like almost 400 people working at the company. Right. Just imagine how different it is to be running like you're a successful hobby publisher, like people in the hobby really like your game. You go to cons, everyone wants your autograph. It's awesome. You know, that's like a 20 person company. When it is a 300, 350 person company, things are super different. Right. Totally. And obviously, you know, and there's definitely parts in here where you see Gygax transit, trying to transition and tr doing some other things and sort of, you know, when they split the company up, they were maybe that was sort of an attempt to compromise and say, okay, well, I get my creative piece and I can do my thing. And then sort of him coming back and realizing, oh, that wasn't gonna, <laughs> that, that didn't quite work the way I had hoped. Um, so, you know, and, and again, all that plays out. One of the things that stuck, stood out for me, I didn't understand, uh, is, it, is it Mar or M-A-R Barker? Um, M-A-R. M-A-R Barker's relationship. Because uh, there was a little bit of comment where guy, guy, you know, Gary was like, he just used the rules and didn't ask for permission. <laughs> and uh, I thought that was interesting. Well, that was, that was probably the first game they be became aware of, right? Because they became yeah. aware of it in the fall of 74. That really was, you know, working off of the blueprint of D&D &D to make a new right. game. Um, right. I mean, of course, the published version of EPT, of Empire of the Petal Throne, wouldn't come out until, you know, the summer of, of 75, around the same time that Tunnels and Trolls came out and was first available in... Um, you know, a couple of small sci-fi conventions in the West and Southwest, like, but, you know, back in August or September of 74, when Arneson is like, hey, there's this, like, university professor here who has this game, and, like, you know, when, when, take a look at it, and so he sent the pre-publication to Gygax, and Gygax, look, and this, this is somebody just copying d, &D. like, this is all our stuff, there's hit points and doubles and classes, and, like, you know, experience points, what, what is this stuff, and, you know, you can understand uh, he wanted to defend this thing as small as it was at the time. This is a time D&D hadn't even sold a thousand copies yet, right? Right. And in, in anything you invent like this, you can always get leapfrogged, right? Like there yeah. always could be just something that comes along that does exactly what you're doing a little better. Like co yeah. copyright and patent law do not provide sufficient protections to prevent people from copying the basic and fundamental ideas of the game. Um, there are a lot of copycats that come around and just do it a little bit better. Um, so I think he was probably terrified when he saw him by the Pedal Throne. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, Tecamel is um, a bit niche in the sense of it doesn't have the same probably universal appeal that Tolkien themed sorts of things did, or even Fritz Leiber and Robert E. Howard, you know, the, the material that Gygax was kind of directly trying to crimp from. But I mean, at the same time, he had to feel a bit protective about it yeah. and you know and, and, and i mean barker was going to publish this with uh one of our innocent friends a guy named bill hoyt who had this little imprint in the twin cities so it was called world at war and actually tsr ended up buying a whole bunch of world at wars titles um they're not very well known but this is like little war game booklets like bio one and field regulations are not not famous ones today these are things they did in the mid 70s that came out of this world at war imprint mm -hmm. and actually world at war even gets a credit if you look at the published version of ept there's a little credit to waw productions that's for for world at war and it was a priority i think for gygax to secure some kind of relationship right with barker and eventually he decided this world of tecamel i mean it's weird but it's actually kind of cool like, this is like another Tolkien. This is somebody who's created this yeah. immense, complicated, rich fantasy world. And like, let's just do this as a product. If we can charge 25 bucks for it, which they did at the time. Again, two and a half times as much as D&D. &D. Right. Because <laughs> like beautiful maps and like this, you know, came in a big box and um, nice rule book, nice illustrations. It was much kind of higher budget. It's kind of a Cadillac feel to Empire of the Petal Throne compared to the other things that TSR was doing. Um, and, you know, it didn't, it was never big, right? I mean, but it has to this day an incredibly devoted, a, a small but devoted following. There are people who just love Tecumel, who just love Empire of the Petal Throne. And um, even after TSR kind of let it go, all these smaller publishers, you know, picked it up and made supplements for it. And, 
you know, uh, Barker finally got to publish his novel, <laughs> like every, everything else around it. So, um, so you, you got to say it, 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 was, it was a good thing, ultimately, I think, that TSR managed to strike a deal with him and to get, get the game out. It's funny because it, you almost feel like in an alternate reality that becomes the Dragonlance that become, you know, like there was this moment where that that could have turned into something bigger. And it may have been the timing, maybe Tecumon wasn't, you know, at the time TSR was definitely like make your own worlds kind of thing. But it's just such a fascinating footnote in sort of where things could have gone, which of course have changed tremendously since um, as to what what looked like an officially endorsed campaign world when they were still figuring that out. Um, but it was to me, I, I didn't realize that that was part of that was that he, you know, I, at one point guy Gax keeps saying, what did he say something along the lines of he keeps saying it's for the good of the hobby. <laughs> like he was really just getting annoyed. <laughs> so really just, it was a fascinating insight for me because you know, some of the stuff, of course, I thought I knew, or I, I knew pieces, but that totally blew me away was sort of this, um, benign, you know, imitation that I, you know, I'm assuming there was this kind of like this, Hey, I'm just doing, Oh, wait a minute. Oh, you care about the rights. Oh, okay. And then it turned into <laughs> negotiations down the, down the line. Um, to that point, you know, and this is an ongoing thing, right? I didn't get the sense that you came down one way or the other to say that Advanced Dungeons and Dragons and Basic Dungeons and Dragons were specifically written to get Arneson out of the, out of the, you know, to basically undermine his lawsuit. Um, was that something like it did? did was that clear you know, in terms of what? Because I've seen now the, the internet arguments that came up around that was like, oh yeah, so that proves it. That was what it was for. And I wasn't sure if that was the case or if that was the point you were trying to make through that, that that was, that's well, where so it was no, I mean, that that timeline doesn't work. So, I mean, the ba basic d d was in the works before Arneson left TSR, let alone suit, right? Right, right. Like, and I mean, advanced basically was in the works as well, like in, in 76. I mean, think about like the Monster Manual, which, you know, was supposed to come out earlier in 77. The only reason it didn't was because of the Tolkien thing. Right. right, is because when they put out that Battle of the Five Armies uh, board game that they had bought from Larry Smith and put, you know, adapted from The Hobbit on it in big letters, and Rankin Bass was about to release their animated version of The Hobbit on, right. was that CBS? I can't remember. Yeah. Um, and suddenly they went looking for like anybody who was trying to ride the coattails of the Rankin Bass Hobbit thing came, coming out, and so they sued TSR over Battle of the Five Armies, and then once they looked at TSR's product suite was like, wait a minute, there's all these token creatures, there's Balrogs and Ents and all this stuff and all your books, you got to get rid of them. Like, you know, the Monster Manual would have come out, I don't want to say right on the heels of Holmes, but I imagine it would have been a Gen Con release in 77. And, you know, Arneson didn't sue until 79, right? Right. Now, this isn't to say that he wasn't already saber rattling by the end of 77. And certainly in early 78, he was threatening to sue. Um, you know, but I mean, this, so the timeline doesn't work that these things were created because of the lawsuit. Now, whether right. they were created to stop paying Arneson is a much more complicated question. Yeah. And like, you know, obviously basic, they decided to give Arneson a co-author credit for, and they mm -hmm. could not have done that in the sense of, you know, the original drafts of the beginner's guide that Eric Holmes did, you know, they listed the credits as Gygax and Holmes, right. Without mm -hmm. Arneson on them. And TSR didn't do that. Like they put out the basic set with Gygax and Arneson and they paid Arneson royalties for the basic set. Those royalties for the basic set incidentally alone made Arneson rich. Like mm -hmm. whatever the, happened with the lawsuits, and this is something Game Wizards is very specific about, before the lawsuits were resolved, once the Egbert incident had happened and the basic set sales went through the roof, that was already making Arneson rich. Yeah. Um, the advanced thing is more complicated. Um, yeah, I mean, so... It's certainly the case that when Arneson was at TSR, people like Brian Bloom were very concerned about the amount in royalties that was being paid to both Gygax and Arneson, that it mm -hmm. was too much. That like, you know, each of them getting basically their, you know, splitting their 10% on like every D&D sale was too much. Mm -hmm. And he managed to convince Gygax to do a contract at the beginning of 1978 that you know gave him a two and a half percent royalty instead of a five percent, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of like splitting ten percent of the cover price, and so really, I mean, in a sense, they were paying Gygax less than they were paying Arneson before Arneson sued. This is the beginning of 1978 that that contract went into effect, and you even see some like intimations that Bloom had been telling Arneson that they wanted to reduce royalties to two point five percent 
at the time Artisan was already there. So there's mm-hmm. in, in Bloom, you know, I mean, he's a complicated character, but Brian Bloom is, I mean, I, I don't want to cast dispersions. Um, you know, I think about it like he viewed himself as being in his father's stead for protecting his father's investment. And his father put 20 grand in 1975 money, which right. is a lot, like, well, well more than a hundred thousand anyway. Right. Right. Um, you know, into TSR that let them buy the little gray house at 723 William Street that became the Dungeon Hobby Shop Museum. Like, you know, and Brian put some of his own money in, but really his father put in a lot more money. And I think Brian felt this obligation to just reduce costs, maximize profits, keep the company as stable as he could. And he did whatever he thought he needed to do to accomplish that. Sometimes he did some things he probably shouldn't have done yeah. <laughs> like his time goes on to accomplish that. But I mean, you know, had they gotten to a point by the time like the monster manual and the player's handbook were coming out where they had decided we just want to cut our distance out on the royalties. Certainly they didn't want to be paying him as much as they were. Mm-hmm. Um, I think also Gygax really did feel that he had developed the game to a point where it was different. Mm-hmm. And I don't think he makes a particularly good case for that. But then again, you know, in the hobby community he came out of, this was the rule, not the exception. This is something, again, I, I point to precedents like when he worked on this obscure um, ancient war game called Arbella yep. that he embellished into what became a product called Alexander the Great. And this is the case where originally there was this guy named Dane Lyons who wrote Arbella. Gygax wrote some fixes for it, published an edition that was Dane Lyons and Gary Gygax, and then created Alexander the Great, which was a separate thing. It was only Gary Gygax with no credit to Dane Lyons. And like he, you know, he just had this sense and he knew the hobby well and its its mores well. He knew its customs. They, they would not be, you know, outside of norms for someone to do what he did. Mm-hmm. You see this again and again. We, we could sit here and dissect all, everything Arneson did too and be like, well, actually Arneson pulled this from this and this from this and cobbled it together and it became this, right? Right. Like you can do this with, with, with like everybody with all their war games. Um, so, I mean, is there a sense in which he thought he was just doing the same thing, that this was the difference between Arbella and Alexander the Great, that yes, there was D&D, but that now I, I'm doing this new thing. And I think it's different enough that like it, you know, it doesn't count as D&D anymore. It's now advanced d and I mean, it's arguable. I don't think it's a particularly good argument. And frankly, in the legal case, like um, one of the depositions from an expert witness really is just focused on this. And I mean, he just demolishes it, right? He just goes through and it's like, what is there we think in ad and that's like substantially different from, D- from you know, original d and that right. really makes these distinct games. Okay, like you change the armor class of this monster, you change the hit points of this monster, but like, come on, man. It's like all the same monsters, all the same classes, all the same spells, like, you know, hit points, experience, or they may like work a little bit differently, but these are all like cosmetic things. There's certainly, I mean, I, I'm pretty sympathetic to arguments of that form. Um, yeah. Yeah, but, no. I mean, but you can also look at this from, you know, the conceptual question is one dimension of it, but then there's a the legal question. And Game Wizards is actually much more focused on the legal question than the conceptual question, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The legal question of Artisan's lawsuit was much more about, did the 1975 contract, when it said, we're going to pay you for every copy of D&D that is sold, mean just that D D box that was available right. in 1975 or did it mean anything that was published on top of that that was D D, right and you know there was a little supplement called greyhawk that was you know they did a contract for at virtually the same time that they did that original contract that 1975 contract for D that doesn't give artisan any credit right and it doesn't give him any royalties it gives all these royalties to gygax and rob coons and like, what is, what can we infer about that from the intent behind the original d d contract? Was the d d contract supposed to apply to any like derivative work that was built uh, on top of d d You know, is the, the monster manual because some of the monsters in it were also in the d d books, does that mean it counts as a copy of d d for the purposes of that original 1975 contract? That I think is a much harder question than the conceptual one of is our d d and ad d the same game? The thing Arneson was actually suing over was, did what this contract mean by every copy sold of, you know, the game or game rules and title Dungeons and Dragons include things that didn't exist at the time that that contract was signed? Right. 
and all of this of course is ripples of time right so it's it's a moment in time you've got two individuals not imagining this thing becoming this massive thing and suddenly this you know who knows how well informed legal conversation turns into these having these ripple effects down the road because the money and the and the popularity had had massively changed and and I love how you you know you end the book which is like so now Gen Con's pulling in numbers that Gygax had always wanted. Now we're like D and D for all that you know we want to compete. Hasbro owns the D and D brand. Like you know the world is in a lot of ways where they were trying to get it. Ironically, um, but they wouldn't. You know they didn't. Sadly, they didn't live to see it. And certainly, it, it they probably wouldn't recognize the company in terms of what's changed. But so fascinating to me um, how much it's changed. And just and a side note, I do want to open up to our, our, our audience too uh, for questions. You know that. Um, that dichotomy of the two different editions ripped my role-playing game group apart because I had uh, all my family members bought me advanced, but they didn't understand the difference. Nobody did. They just like basic D and D. So I had like all the hard covers and I had the basic. And when we got to the master set, we basically were like, I was like, Oh my gosh, there's two different editions. And that's why these games don't work together as well as we'd hoped. Uh, I think we should switch to advanced. And they were like, but there's the master set. I don't want to go to, we want to be masters. We don't want to go to, and uh, we actually broke up. The whole group like exploded. And, and this is high school, you know, uh, and then came back together because, uh, you know, it didn't last for long, but it was such a fascinating, again, you know, this is why I talk about closure where you have this perspective that you don't know what's going on. We just knew what was going on in front of us. We didn't know why, why was there a basic and an advanced and how did, How'd you go from one to the other? Like that was a whole mystery too. Like, when am I ready? And then of course, basic kept going. You know, we we're like, oh, well, after you finish, you know, a couple of books, then you, you're done. And then you go to, you go to advanced. And you know, oh, is it an age thing? Is it a reading? Call? Like what makes you advanced? Um, it was really a, a, an interesting challenge. And it played out at my table with my players um, where I, I decided we were advanced and they were like, no, we're not. <laughs> we're not advanced don't don't thrust us into that we're right <laughs> right it's really fascinating well, um, at least peter Atkinson put a nail on that that coffin right when when he took over and said there isn't going to be like advanced anymore there's just going to be D. and it's such a quick note in there that peter sort of settled that you know it's like which it was some of all these old arguments that consumed you know like i said entire groups and and companies he was like we're done that's it you know, and partially because things had blown up so much that you could do that, right? And do the reset, which I think is great. Um, I do want to give, so Sylvia, Lucio, and Bill, if, if you had any questions, because I will just talk to John forever. Um, do yeah. you have any questions? Go ahead, Sylvia, if you had something. Yes. Um, I didn't read all the book. I just read until page 87 yet. But what, from my point of view, uh, which is psychological, psychoanalyst, uh, Gygus was a clear example of someone who pursued his desire. He went, at, in the beginning of the book, you see a lot of times he, he wrote, I have to get out of this. I have to... to, to to make a living for my family. Mm -hmm. I have to the, the, this religion too and sing and so, and he came back and he always came back because the, I, I can tell you this is unconscious desire that made him go in this direction that was what he liked. Yeah, I mean, it's- uh... kind of, uh, it's a he. He made a challenge. He challenged the establishment to to pursue his desire, and he got it. He 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 really get. You may say, "Oh, the TSR went off and so on," but he is a mark. He is a, a, the fundamental person who creates something completely different different from before in terms of games and not only games, the, the range of, of role-playing role games is fantastic. So there is no uh, achievement, as we say in, in psychoanalysis, without loss. Mm -hmm. And so you, you, you gain and you, you lost. So that's what I think was happened to him but anyhow he is 
his story is fantastic. I love it. I just love it. And by the way, we met in Rio de Varnson. He went to a, one of these uh, role-playing games uh, meeting there. He yeah. was, yes, he was uh, already in, in oxygen. He was very ill, but he gave a lecture to us. Fantastic. Oh, yeah, wow. he was a great guy. And, and as much as we say about Gary's story and what he created, you know, we should never neglect the part of it that Dave actually did contribute to it. Um, you know, Gary always worked best as, a, I think, a developer, somebody who could develop other people's ideas. And he had that will, like you said, to, to yeah. get what he wanted. But a drive. He, he worked best when he reacted against other people. When you get further in the book, you'll see when he became more insular, when he wasn't reacting against other people anymore, it was really hard mm -hmm. for him to be creative, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, somehow, when you have to deal with things, you are not. Uh, 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 you, I think it's. Uh, I mean, I'm just imagine that at some point he didn't want to 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 to, to, to deal with this company things, the business itself. His aim, his desire, his drive was on the rules and on the games. J Thanks, just man. for, yes, who, who has been here was Dave Arneson, who has been here now in Rio, was Dave Arneson, not Geiger. Oh, yeah, yeah, I heard you, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I think okay. I heard you've been there. I, I got to okay. hang out with him a bit as well in the last years of his life. Um, like I said, he was, a, he was a very interesting character. Um, <laughs> smart guy. Thank you, Sylvia. Bill, did you have something? I, I don't know. I saw your cameras on. Uh, no, I didn't. I haven't had a chance to read the book yet, but thank you for writing it. I'm hearing all the great buzz about it. This has been fascinating. No, it's my uh, pleasure. Uh, it, it, it just came out. I don't really expect everyone to have read it. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I look forward to it because it's the era that I got into d and was 79 and uh, all that. So I'm curious to hear about all these things. And uh, like the Blooms, I only knew Brian Bloom from uh, the early years of White Wolf when we uh, needed maps. We'd hire him to, to do the maps. So I only knew him as a map maker for the longest time. I knew he did something with Boot Hill, but uh, I didn't know until years later that he was involved in you know, running TSR for the longest time. He was involved with running TSR. And he did like cartography, actually. He did a lot of map work for TSR as well, uh, as did Dave Sutherland, of course, uh, another, another big character in the book. Mm -hmm. that's one of my favorite things too is seeing all the company the company comics the company newsletters because all those things tell their own story um and they act as a record that you know maybe wasn't meant that way but that's what they become because they're they're what we have left and it's certainly um such a fa i always because you know of course i work in in fortune five companies so it's so fascinating because i imagine my newsletters <laughs> looking 20 30 years later and people are trying to interpret what the culture was like i thought it was fascinating um, so I want to be sensitive to time. We have five minutes left. What's next for you? I know there's things. <laughs> I know you're not just going to do anything. So what's next? <laughs> there are things. Um, I don't know if there are anything. I, I don't know if there are anything I'm allowed to talk about. Um, I will say, yeah, I, I certainly am working on more kind of popular things along the Art and Arcana and Heroes Feast line um, since those did pretty well. You can imagine people are interested in more of that. And I'm yep. certainly working on more scholarly things as well. Excellent. Um, Excellent. But I mean, you know, how much more am I really going to say about like this era? Like I got to look at something else. Like, you know, yeah. I don't want to squat on this for, you know, decades of my life. I, I already have pretty much. Yeah. So yeah. You know, I got to get out of like role playing games of the seventies. Hey, <laughs> please let me escape. Ben Riggs, <laughs> save me. You write books. All right, hey, you do it, Ben. You write books. Please, somebody, somebody Someone... do this. Well, I, I mean, I feel like your books have been doing exactly that, right? Like that's what my, that was my point when we first started in this conversation, which is that playing at the world set the foundation and each one builds on the next. But to your point, like, I don't, I don't see you going necessarily backwards, right? Because I feel like you you made good arguments to you you help define what role playing is. You help talk about sort of the nature of the business and the industry. And now you're talking about the relationship. I think all of those, you know, you are to your point, sort of covering 
a lot of the major pieces. So I, I can't wait to see what you're doing next. So how do we support you? Uh, I don't know. Um, I mean, if you are welcome to buy my books, I, you know, I think some of them at least are still in print. Um, yeah, there's one that's like $500 on Amazon now. So I, I think maybe playing out the world is like out of print and you can't get it anymore. I think that might be true. But like, you know, I, 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 I don't know. Um, you can support me by doing awesome things with role playing games. That's probably the best thing you can do. Awesome. Well, we'll definitely, we'll definitely keep doing that and we'll, we'll follow you. So um, certainly, uh, where can we follow you on social? I know you don't you don't necessarily love it, but <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I have a, a Twitter account. It's um, at Docetis D O C E T I S T. Like, uh, there's a Playing at the World Facebook page. I think that's mm -hmm. it. Like, I'm and your really... blog, obviously, right? So you've got My your blog. Yeah. Your, your blog. Yep. Excellent. So we'll uh, what I'll do what I do every uh, after every virtual session is we do a summary. Uh, I make sure I have all your links. So if there's something that you think of separately or that I don't cover. Um, you know, by all means, and I'll put links into to purchasing all your books, um, all of them, because maybe well, why not, right? And make sure we can uh, we, we support you, because I think this is if the Carby GA has a sort of a, a mission, I think one of them for sure is what you're doing, right? Which is um, to the extent that we can set the record straight, uh, to the extent we can, because records are you know like everything else, it seems like it's open interpretation. But I think these what you're doing is really important, and all spaces. Uh, you know, I've eaten about half of the, the recipes that you guys worked on. So, <laughs> so you know, it was delicious. So, you know, it, everything you do is uh, is uh, really uh, an important part of uh, gaming, be it uh, food or history. So really appreciate everything you do, John. Well, thanks so much. And again, thanks for having me. And thanks for all you guys are doing.